whenever you're ready to. Okay. I'm John Kelsey, a member of the Department of Religion at Florida State University. Uh, with me in the studio today is my colleague, Martin Kafka, and we are going to have a conversation with Richard Rubenstein, formerly the Robert O. Lawton Professor uh, in the Department of Religion at Florida State and now Professor Emeritus. Uh, Richard, thank you for being willing to talk with us this afternoon. Well, it, uh, to me, it's, it's really a joy to come back here and to see the progress that the department and the university have made. Have made. It really makes me feel very good. Yeah, great. Um, let's start this way. Um, you're here this weekend, September 19 and 20, uh, for the 50th anniversary of the Department of Religion at Florida State. Uh, as it happens, we're also coming up on the 50th anniversary of after Auschwitz, the first, oh, yeah. first yeah. edition. Um, tell us a little bit about how you came to be at Florida State University, and was there a connection between after Auschwitz and your coming? There was, in a way. Uh, I, uh, first of all, it all starts with a walk in Dusseldorf. I, at the time, was married to Ellen van der Veen, who came from a Dutch Jewish family. Uh, on the 10th of May, 1940, uh, the Nazis invaded Holland. And the only people who read the signals properly was my father-in-law, Max van der Veen, who said they aimed to kill us. Everybody else hesitated and perished. Max got his three children and his wife into their car. They left a very, very splendid home in a town called Ardenhout, which is listed on Facebook as the richest town in the Netherlands, and without passport or anything else, they went to Eimauden, which is the harbor of Amsterdam, and miraculously they were able to get on a, um, a British minesweeper and get to America. That's when they came to Cincinnati where I was a student at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, I met Ellen, and eventually we became engaged and got married. So hovering behind us was a, a special version of the Holocaust. It was the Holocaust in which, as I put it to my children, this is a, if it wasn't for Max van der Veen, your grandfather, you never would have been alive. And they were aware of it, and I was aware of it. So starting out from there, uh, 20 years after 1940, I, was, I had just finished, after a long, long period, my doctoral dissertation at Harvard, and I said to myself, this is a period of maximum danger. I had been so preoccupied with writing my thesis, all of a sudden I'm going to have, no t I have time on my hands. I said the best thing to do with time on my hands is to get out of the United States and get where I, I can't look for a job or do any of the foolish things. I was not ready to move. So uh, I told Ellen, let's go to uh, Holland for the summer. Uh, at the time, uh, it was 20 years since she left Holland with the family. And we went to spend the summer in uh, a town called Baikonze, which is on the coast, meet her surviving relatives, and uh, allowed Ellen to return to some kind of acquaintance with what she had left. Incidentally, uh, although she left 
uh, in safety. She nevertheless uh, was psychically wounded for it for the rest of her life. So uh, we got back to Holland and we stayed in a town on the North Sea coast uh, called Vikonze. And in that town, I decided, you know, I'd like to go and see what Germany is like. This is 20 years after the war. And my son, Aaron, who was, ceased, who was since deceased, I said, you come along with me. He was 11 at the time. And I figured that the easiest town to get to for us was Dusseldorf. That is the easiest major town. So one day in the spring, we uh, took the rail from Amsterdam to Dusseldorf. We didn't know where we were going. We didn't know what to look for. We just you know we were going to look at Dusseldorf. We arrive in Dusseldorf. I get a uh, room for us to stay in. Then I start walking on the street. And uh, before I know it, I come to a building with a brand new synagogue. And the synagogue, uh, apparently the Nazis had destroyed, destroyed the old synagogue. And a uh, beautiful new synagogue, but I noticed on the side of the synagogue there was a sign that said, Allgemeine Wochenzeitung der Juden in Deutschland, Universal Jewish Newspaper of Jews in Germany. I knock on the door, they let me in, I explain that I'm a, an editor of the Reconstructionist, which is an at the time an American Jewish intellectual newspaper. We talk for a while and then they say, you know, uh, in Bad Godesburg right now at the Hotel Dresden, which by the way was where Neville Chamberlain and uh, Adolf Hitler were holding their negotiations a couple of years before uh, for the, the Munich Agreement. And they're holding this uh, for American Jewish leaders, if you want, I can get you invited. So I said, sure, be happy to do it. So I'm, I'm there for a day, I, I don't know what I'm doing, and all of a sudden, I'm the guest of the West German government at a high level uh, meeting of American Jewish leaders and German diplomats in Bad, Bad Godesburg. It went well. I got to know a man by the name of Graf Franz von Schweinitz, who was the diplomat in charge. And I mentioned to him, well, I'll be coming back next year. And he said, well, if you come back next year, we can show you uh, around the Rhineland. We were in Amsterdam, so southern Germany was more likely. And I said, oh, that would be splendid. So I planned to come back next year. And uh, I was scheduled to come back on August 13th. Well, everything was fine except when I got up in the morning on August 13th, I turn on the radio and I hear that the East Germans had closed the border between East and West Germany. So I call Bonn and I tell them, I very much want to come, but I'm a married man. I'd like to wait a few days before I come. And they say, fine. That was on a Sunday, which is uh, then on Tuesday, we all realized that there was not going to be any world war or nuclear exchange. And so I said, I'd like to come. And they said, well, come this evening. And I arrive in Bonn from Amsterdam at six in the evening with my son. And they say, uh, this was a Frau Driesen. And she greets me and says, would you like to go to Berlin? Well, the plan had been for me to go to the Rhineland. So I said, of course. She rips out a, or takes out a, uh, a railroad ticket for both of us, which was already, no, it wasn't a railroad ticket, it was a, uh, uh, a flight, and you had to go through, uh, only American, French, and British planes were allowed to get in. We were both given tickets to go into Berlin at this maximum time of, uh, crisis. We arrived that evening in Berlin and 
we find a uh, room and the Bundespresser Amt, the Press and Information Office, started to show me around to different people. One of the people that they showed me around was uh, a man by the name of Probst Gruber, uh, Dean Gruber. Now, Dean Gruber was a very special German. Uh, first of all, he was one of the few Germans who not only uh, opposed Hitler but aided uh, Jews during the Holocaust and was put into a concentration camp for it. He was also the only German clergyman, any only German, who was um, uh, at uh, who testified against Adolf Eichmann the previous summer in uh, uh, the trial in Tel Aviv. So I, I realized all of a sudden I was sort of drifting into uh, Germany and quite by accident I'm a newly minted Harvard PhD who under normal circumstance would be too young for it and I'm immediately uh, given access to some of the leading German thinkers and theologians, the most important being uh, Dean Gruber. And so uh, Dean Gruber, who's, who's a good man, and he, I think he didn't think I thought so, uh, and one of the statements which he made was, it was God's will to send Adolf Hitler to punish the Jews at Auschwitz. And I said, hey, this isn't going to work. And it became the basis of my book after Auschwitz because it, it was where, first of all, I realized that Dean Gruber was not a Nazi. Secondly, that he was speaking from a certain biblical point of view. And I realized that that biblical point of view was held by both Jewish and Christian thinkers, not all of them, but a lot of them. And so I said, no, this isn't going to work. I can't buy this. And I then began to feel I had to write about it. And, I mean, it would have taken me a number of years before I'd get a publisher interested in what I had to say. But the, the combination of uh, Meeting Dean Gruber, the drama of the Berlin Wall and everything that went with it, the fact that it was in Germany, meant that people paid a lot more attention to what I was saying than if I just scribbled something out uh, at my desk in at the time was Pittsburgh. So I, I've sometimes thought to myself, my God, I, I take a walk in Dusseldorf and I end up with, a, uh, with what I have to talk about, what I have to write about. Well, that was the beginning of it. The other thing that happened is while I was at Harvard, I had a very good friend, Charles Merrill. Charles Merrill's father was the founder of Merrill Lynch. And uh, at one point he said, you know, Richard, you, uh, I want you to go to Poland and I want you to enter into conversations with Polish Catholic intellectuals. There were some hard feelings between Jews and uh, Catholics at the time in Poland. And he, out of his own resources, he sent me to uh, Poland. Uh, he had excellent contacts. There was an organization called Znak, uh, which was the only really reliable Catholic organization that the communist government permitted to, uh, ma to maintain itself. And uh, I met with these Polish Catholic intellectuals. We, we, we got along. Uh, there was one man, Jacek Wojnachowski, whose son later became the uh, vice 
premier of uh, Poland. And uh, again, I was faced with the Holocaust. Well, not only that, but after Auschwitz was written, on the, within two or three weeks I started to write it of my returning from Poland and visiting Auschwitz for the first time. I, I hadn't realized it, but I, I was in Poland three weeks before visiting Auschwitz when it was not yet a tour site or anything like that. And I began to reflect on what was going on. One of the things that struck me, I had a great deal of respect for the major Jewish thinkers of the time. And I also was aware of the fact that because of my background, my background was not that of somebody steeped in Jewish learning. And one of the reasons was very simple, that uh, these fellows got their Jewish learning with their mother's milk. I couldn't read Hebrew until I was 18. But still, I had the feeling that they were ignoring the most important Jewish question of their time. That is the question of God and the Holocaust. And if you look at the uh, preface to After Auschwitz, I talk about these great Jewish thinkers who don't talk about this. Now, I understand why they didn't talk about it. The wound was too great. They couldn't handle it. And they certainly weren't going to ask the kind of questions that I did. So uh, it was this combination of going to Germany to Dusseldorf, then going to Poland, and being at Auschwitz. I never thought about it until I started to write the uh, second edition of uh, uh, my autobiography, that I was at the American Academy of Religion raising these questions three weeks after I had visited Auschwitz. So all this came together, and it was as existential as anything that ever happened to me. The other thing which is existential about it is that uh, I knew that the family that I had that came from a very elegant background would have been dead uh, had it not been for Max van der Veen and his thinking. So all these things played in. Even though I grew up in the United States, my father and mother were American born. My father served in the First World War. It wasn't remote to me, and that's how I got into it, and that's where it got started. Mm -hmm. it, it's not in my first edition. I guess some things are too painful to go over, but now at age 91, I'm prepared to go over them. Sure. Even even on an on a abstract level, you had been writing about the problem of God and evil in some of your first essays in The Reconstructionist in 1959 and 1960. Yes, I realize that, but somehow or other I didn't connect all the dots. Ah. See? And it, it was only when I, I mean, I, I kind of realized it, but I didn't want to uh, be the troubler of Israel. And I ended up knowing that I had to be. And I wasn't trying to make trouble. I, I really wasn't. What John, who knows me very well, knows is that I am not a radical. I am not a, a troublemaker. But there were certain questions which were unavoidable that nobody else was asking, so I had to ask them. And you hadn't sought out Dean, uh, Dean Gruber uh, after the Eichmann trial. It was just sort of... Oh, no, no. It was, it was that I had accidentally taken a walk in Dusseldorf and met some German officials who led me to him. See, it was... I, I didn't go looking for Dean Gruber. I, I would never have presumed. I mean, I may have been a Harvard PhD, but I was way down at at the bottom of the uh, the ladder at that time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but they brought me. 
And I, I, you know, I sometimes wonder if there must be some kind of providence because I couldn't have, I couldn't have invented things the way they happened, but they did. See. When you, when you first wrote about your visit with Heinrich Gruber, I believe it was in 1962, in, in The Reconstructionist. That's right. So was that was was it already controversial at that time, what, or no, did it, it really make let, a splash let me, let me, in 1966? No, it, it it did not make a splash until it got real media attention, and that was at the conference at Emory University on America and the Future of Theology, and you know the whole. Th I'm still amazed by what happened to me because uh, I wasn't creating a career path or anything like that. Look, uh, I no, I I I I was thinking about these things, but if I hadn't. Uh, come to Emory. And how did I come to Emory? I receive a letter that there's going to be a conference on America and the future of theology. It's when the Death of God movement was at its height. I hadn't, I had no knowledge of the Death of God movement. See, I didn't know who any of these guys were, but they had been reading my articles mm. and they, and they, I, know, I know they, they wanted to show that the problem was more universal. Therefore, very good to have a Jewish theologian in the group. And so um, they went over this material and decided to invite me to uh, be part of the Emory um, conference. Well, in terms of a media event, that was incredible, mm -hmm. see, because First of all, there was a Time Magazine cover, Is God Dead? Famous cover. Famous cover. And then after Is God Dead, you get the kind of coverage, media coverage, I didn't plan it like this. So when they wrote to me and they offered me, they said, we'd like to have you respond to Thomas Altizer. I didn't know who Tom Altizer was. I hadn't been reading his stuff. And, but they knew who I was. So I remember they offered me a $35 honorarium if I would come plus my travel expenses. My answer was yes, because I realized that the subject was important. One other detail is that uh, the time cover, if I remember correctly, I have it in my new autobiography, came out just about the time when the uh, whole controversy was stirring up. And then what happened, which was quite surprising, is when I responded to uh, Tom, I, I said that if God is dead, I will not dance at the funeral. And that caught on to the conservative Southern Protestants who were there. There were about 1,200 of them. And I said that uh, that's not a happy event. I mean, Ch uh, John was, I mean, Tom was making it into some kind of an act of liberation. And I said, no, it's not like that. Uh, it's a very sad event, a tragic event. And what happened, Roger Shin wrote about it is that I caught on with the Protestants, mm. see, which is something else that I, I hadn't realized. Because what I understood is that if they did not have faith in Christ, they would have been on my side. And I had media attention for a number of years. I'll tell you where I began to cool it with my media attention. When I came to uh, my job at uh, Florida State, I didn't want media attention. 
I'd had enough. I didn't want to come down there and be a media superstar and immediately become controversial. I just wanted to be an academic at Florida State. So the, the, all these things, and then you get somebody like Roger Shin, who was the dean of uh, Union Theological Seminary, writing about me rather than about these guys. Mm -hmm. So uh, I honestly, it, it it happened. It was if if I could think of Providence as advancing my career, and I wasn't trying to advance my career. I wasn't even thinking of my career. It would be the things that happened around the death of God controversy. So one other thing about it. There was a meeting at the University of Michigan, I believe it was, in which uh, there was a, an attempt to create a union of um, the people who were radical theologians was those who were advancing radical politics. And I got up and said, no. I said, radical theology can also lead to conservative politics. Because I'm talking about a, a tragic vision. And tragic visions aren't always what uh, the radicals make them out to be. It, it, I will also say that it uh, created many, many enemies in my own community for me. You were also very clear that the, the post-Holocaust age and the new ideas that needed to come about at that time required some kind of cultural pain. They had to, and, and, and I understand why it didn't come about. The trauma was too great. I wasn't trying to push it that I was right. But when you go through the worst trauma in 2,000 years, it's not going to be easy. And I recognize that. So I wasn't trying to push anything. And I think you'll find that there are very few places where I defend my position. I simply state it again and again. Mm. See, I don't think you'll find that I, I took on a lot of people. One of the reasons why I didn't is my second wife, uh, I regard as a great lady. Uh, she uh, came from a um, upper class a really upper-class German-Jewish family. And she had uh, social instincts that I didn't have. And she wouldn't let me make a fool of myself. And she made, by the way, she, she was especially happy that I came to Florida State. And she said to me, don't ever leave to go to the Northeast, <laughs> to New York. And he said, this is where you belong. You, you don't belong in the Northeast. Um, Interesting. Richard, go yeah. back to that Emory conference for a moment. Yeah. Because there's a, a link between that and your coming to Florida State University. Yes, yes. Well, that was, that was another thing that I didn't understand. Uh, well, while after I uh, I spoke, um, some Bob Spivey and some friends who were members of the uh, religion department of Florida State and who were trying to build up a relatively new department came over to me and said, would I be interested in coming to Florida State? And, and quite frankly, I didn't hear them uh, because I was a provincial Northerner, and I, I couldn't see myself going down to Florida of all places. Bob Spivey led the group, but then Bob invited me 
it may have been Bob and some other members of the department, to be a visiting professor for a term. And I went down to Florida State. Uh, I was beginning to have some problems with my board at the University of Pittsburgh, which is another subject. But uh, Betty and I very quickly realized that we liked it down here, that it was a good place. And then Betty said, this is the place for you. And it was at Emory, and I didn't even register the first time. I mean, if I had set out to plan a career, I would never have done it the way I did it. I would have immediately picked up on Bob a number of other things I would have done. Mm -hmm. uh, but they all fell into line. Mm -hmm. and, and they worked. And I stayed at Florida State not only for 25 years, but now it's, what is it, 45 years later since this happened. I have a very deep commitment to Florida State. Hmm. No. Now, um, when you made the move to come to Florida State, uh, you had been working at the University of Pittsburgh. Right, and Carnegie Mellon. Right. And uh, you, you sort of doubled as a, um, a Hillel rabbi and a, um, a lecturer right. in various subjects. So moving to Florida State really put you in an academic setting in a public university. And that's where I wanted to be. Right. Now you went on then, I mean you wrote a number of books yeah. of course, but you, you went on to revisit issues connected with the Holocaust in The Cunning of History and The Age of Triage and approaches to Auschwitz mm -hmm. and eventually a second edition of After Auschwitz. Talk about the way that being at Florida State and working in a, a distinctive public university department of religion. How did that affect your approach? In, in a lot of ways. Uh, first of all, I think that um, one of the advantages of the teaching of religion in public universities is that in the better public universities, one is free to explore the issues that develop uh, without worrying about the political interests of one group or another. And um, in my case, there was a strong feeling on the part of some members of my community that um, how can a rabbi be talking about the um, a death of God theology in 2,000 years? There was nothing like this. And had I, I know that had I stayed as a part-time Hillel rabbi, they would have eaten me alive. Hmm. And I don't and I don't blame them. They, they were doing things from their point of view. What I realized right from the beginning at Florida Strait State was that I was dealing with people who were absolutely trustworthy, who were as committed to the scientific study, that is the study of religion without worrying about which group likes the opinion, which group does not, as long as it's responsible. I was kind of liberated when I got here. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, you know uh, recently I had uh, uh, lunch with my friend Harvey Cox, and he was telling me he's just done a book, uh, a second edition of uh, Paul Tillich's book on the courage to be. And he told me that, Tillich told him that one of the great 
moments of liberation for him as much as he appreciated Union Theological Seminary, when he could finally be in a university. Whereas, as long as he was in a seminary, there was always the question, was he in conformity with one doctrinal issue or another? The minute he got into a seminary, all that was gone. And the minute, I mean, the minute he got into to a university, not a seminary, and, uh, the minute I got into Florida State, I knew I would not have to fight doctrinal battles of any kind, uh, that I would, I would be free. Now, I don't blame the people who disapproved of what I was saying. I think they were wrong. I think I was responsible at all times, but I also think that I had spent half a lifetime on what can be called the scientific study of religion, and I knew something about what I was talking about, where some of the people who uh, objected to me had very little knowledge of what was going on. So I, I have a, I mean, FSU really liberated me took a load off my shoulders and the load basically was that I didn't have to respond to people who thought they knew about the history of religion, thought, thought they knew about the Holocaust, but really didn't. And that those people who really spent their lives working on it and were quite responsible about it. They didn't, they didn't go into this field to make uh, statements which were irresponsible. Uh, they belonged in the university. They, uh, even, um, I mean, I tell it as a perfect example. One of the greatest Protestant theologians of the 20th century, he appreciated the fact that they had rescued him from the Nazis but he knew he could not be his full self until he was in a university rather than the seminary. That, so, no, Florida State, it was a veil lifted from my shoulders. Yeah. They, did, ha did having that freedom change the content of your views? Not very much, no. No, I, I continued to say the same things. I mean, I was saying different things, uh -huh. But no, uh, my problem was that it wasn't the content of what I was saying. It was, uh, there were some very angry people who basically would have wanted to have either defrocked me, which is not a Jewish term, but uh, who would have, who, there were three attempts made to have me expelled from my rabbinic organization. And I had a very interesting experience with that. When I got to the University of Bridgeport, um, as president of the university, I didn't like to be called rabbi. Why? Because I was no longer acting in a rabbinic mm -hmm. capacity. And it, it would have been, I, I, I didn't want to be known that way. But about four or five years after I'm at Bridgeport and, and Fairfield, I recognized that members of my congregation in Fairfield, Connecticut, were beginning to call me rabbi instead of professor. When I got there, they called me professor. And then for a number of years, that continued. And then I, I hear them starting to call me rabbi. Uh, to me, that was very threatening, because that meant that they thought they had a claim on me, which they didn't. So they began to call me rabbi, and I realized it was different this time. 
What they were really doing was saying, you're one of us, and we welcome you as one of us. Mm. And the pressure was completely off me. And after that, if they called me rabbi, I didn't care. Oh, it's not who I am. I mean, I had rabbinic training, but, and I'm glad I had, but um, I did welcome when they started to call me, not because I wanted that title, that's, uh, you know, as a president of a non-sectarian university, or as a um, professor in the graduate school of a university, I don't want some of the students to feel somewhat separated from me. As professor, they're all part of my thing. Well, since you mentioned uh, going to Bridgeport, uh, when you retired from Florida State yeah. and you were named uh, Professor Emeritus, you did move to uh, become the president of the University of right. Bridgeport. And since um, leaving that post, you continue to teach. Uh, well, there's a sense in which I have never left Bridgeport. Uh, but I mean, you, you stopped being the president. You've continued oh, I became to teach. President Emeritus. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you, you've you continued to teach. Yes, I have. And uh, you and I have had conversations from time to time about your courses. Uh, talk about to what you're teaching this term. Well, the first thing I, I, I want to say uh, is that when I came to Bridgeport, there were no courses in religion. So I wanted the Department of Religion. But I made up my mind that the place to put a Department of Religion was not in the College of Arts and Sciences. The place to put it is in our College of Public and International Affairs. Why? Because you see every day how religion is a political and a social phenomenon. And that's where people who are going to, uh, some of our people go on to UN jobs, uh, they go on to jobs with international organizations, and they can't avoid a very important knowledge of religion. And it's immediately available to them, and they immediately understand it. So we have no trouble with uh, enrollment. In religion, it was different because, uh, you know, the, the people talked about religion as uh, the Bible as, liter as religion, religion and literature and stuff mm -hmm. like important. But that's not where the demand is. So what do I teach? Well, this term I'm teaching a course which I've taught three times before, the socio-political impact of religion on contemporary society. And the most important person that I deal with is a German philosopher by the name of Max Weber. And I teach these Muslim students, about a third of our class is Muslim. Uh, I teach them about Weber and his contributions to making it clear just how important a formative uh, formative element religion is in world culture. I, I can think of no other great thinker who does that as well as uh, Max Weber, who, who lived towards the end of the 20th century and the uh, first two decades of the... Uh, so one thing they get from me is a very heavy dose mm -hmm. of Weber and his sociology of religion. Mm -hmm. They can't escape that from me. That's one thing they get from me. I also have taught courses. Um, in 2014, I taught a course on um, just called World War I, mm -hmm. because it truly is, as you know, the great watershed of what happened in mm -hmm. America. And one of the things that I stress is uh, that what mo most people don't realize is that the treaties that were signed 
in 1918 were treaties imposed by Western Christians on Muslims. Mm -hmm. And that that wasn't going to stay that way. And what I try to show them is how what was going on in 1914 to 1918 and then beyond cannot be divorced from the kind of treaties, which again is dealing with religion. I mean, to think that you can study World War I without this utterly fundamental fact of the way in which the, the peace treaties, I mean, you see this with uh, the, uh, the terrible events of Syria. Uh, I mean, where, where did all this come from? Well, the British and the French thought they could divide up the Muslim world to suit themselves. And they didn't realize what a danger they were creating for themselves in the world. I mean, that's, this is the sort of thing I, I do sure. with it. Say. This is along the lines of Churchill's famous observation about the way that uh, the historically Muslim territories were divided up among yeah. the Europeans. Gentlemen, I think we may have just made a peace to end all peace. Right. Yeah, as a matter of fact, there's a book, mm -hmm. A Peace to End All Peace, which is one of my texts. Yes. Um, yes. So that, that's another thing that I, I do. Uh, at the moment, I don't remember. I, one term, I did a course on the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. I, uh, it was well attended, and they have a lot to learn from it. But I think since I'm only teaching one course a term, the whole question of Islam is much more important. As you understand, there is a responsible way of dealing with Islam in the West. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that happened to me is I got a French publisher, um, and he, uh, I, got, I got a call once while I was up at Yale at the time as a postdoctoral fellow, and he calls me from Paris and he says, we would like to do a French translation of The Cunning of History. And I said, okay. Then a couple of weeks later, he writes to me and says, could you possibly do un postfas, a uh, afterword for the cunning of history? And it's quite obvious that things have happened to change things. And I, I said, yes. And I'll tell you what, what the post-fuss was all about. The post-fuss was all about the fact that the attempt on the part of European Christians to try to integrate Muslims into their political communities was bound to fail. It might work in the United States with you, somebody can be Americanized. You can't Germanize somebody. You can't Italianize somebody. So I wrote a, uh, a whole new chapter, which only appears in French. And I, uh, I knew I knew I was onto something. That and this was in 2010. That. It's never appeared in English, although there now is an English version in the New English Review, which just appeared a month or two ago. I, I, I pointed out that uh, what the Europeans are doing is going to create major trouble, explosive trouble, and they're not facing it. 
That's not the same thing as saying you can't trust Muslims or anything like that. If you don't take this under consideration, and if you simply think that you can deal with Muslims without considering the differences of religion and law that you have in them, you're not going to get very far. And where did I get this knowledge? Studying Islam. And then I went on, as you know, and I, uh, maybe not the most perfect book on Islam, but I was taking this thing one step further with a book called Jihad and Genocide, which did appear in French and in English. So, um, I can't say that I've done one thing, but I, I, I see problems which I can't ignore. Mm -hmm. And then I, I deal with them. And but the, way, the way you're dealing with problems now seems uh, to me to be continuous with something you've said over the long sweep of your career, which is the importance of facing reality. You got it. This is not an easy thing to do. And this gentleman has been doing it. One of the reasons we became friends early on is we both know how to face reality. That's a, a nice compliment coming from you, Richard. Well, but it's true, and you know it's true. <laughs> See? Uh, I'm, I'm not a hidebound uh, conservative or anything like that. I just try to face reality. And too many people deal with these things not as they are, but as they would like them to be. Mm. I think that might be a good note for us to end on. Well, I want to thank both of you for inviting me here and uh, doing this. And I'm especially grateful to the department for inviting me to come back and join in this, the celebration. I'm very grateful for everything that Florida State did for me. It's a pleasure to see you in Tallahassee, Richard. Okay.